Welcome to Crossbridge. My name is Pastor Kevin, and I am the lead pastor here. Um, I always want to make sure that I welcome um, all of our campuses. In fact, we are one church in a variety of locations. We have those at our Ottawa campus. We have those at our Peru campus. And then we have those at our online campus. And so however you're tuning in, we trust that, uh, man, um, God is going to be present with you. And we hope that you hear from him. And so welcome. You know, I, I want to make sure I tell you, this is, this is Palm Sunday. And uh, which means, we're going to talk some about that here in just a second. But uh, what really, one of the things that's obvious, right, is that next weekend is Easter weekend. And I love Easter weekend. Um, man, people pack into our campuses. Uh, a whole lot of people who normally um, do not attend Crossbridge attend on that weekend. And we are anticipating wonderful things. Um, at our Ottawa campus, we're talking about 5 o'clock on Saturday night, about 8, 9.30, and 11 on Sunday morning. And then at our Peru campus, we're talking about 5 o'clock on Saturday night, and then 9 and 10.30 on Sunday morning. It took me a moment, Peru. Uh, I had to think from it way too many times going on. But hey, make sure, and I'm not just saying for you to show up. I, I want to say make sure that you bring somebody with you that you're showing up and you're making some uh, key invites this week. In fact, we're praying for you, that God's going to lay some people on your heart. You're going to go get them, as we talked about last week, and you're going to bring them and they're going to join you at Crossbridge. Um, and then maybe there's some who you just say, they can't come, they won't come. I'm absolutely sure of it, Kevin. Then point them to our online campus. It's exactly what it's for. And so I would encourage you to, to do that as well. Our online campus actually fires up officially um, the Thursday after Easter weekend. And we are really, really excited about that. All right. Um, we're talking, uh, the, we've been in this series, Love Like Jesus. We've talked about a lot of different ways in which we can love like Jesus. And, and the truth is this, if Jesus is love, which we know he is, scripture tells us that, right? That we need his help if we have any hope of applying some of the things we've been talking about the last several weeks. As we're wrapping up the series today, um, the thing that came to mind for me was this, that if, if love is going to flow through us, if love's going to flow through me, then Jesus has to be king of this heart and of your hearts. There's no way he flows through you and flows through your heart if he's not the king of your heart. And so what does it look like? That's the question, right? The question that comes to mind that I've been focused on um, this week is, is this. What does it look like for Jesus to be the king of our hearts? What does it look like for him to reign in our lives in a way in which he is absolutely top priority king, right? I want to read to you Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Um, this is, it's called Jesus' triumphant entry. Uh, again, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead and said, go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you'll see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you what you're doing, just say the Lord needs them and he will and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He's humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of them, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I'm thankful for those who have gathered in all of our campuses at Auto, at Peru, online, uh, for people who are checking you out for the first time, and Lord, people who are tuned into you every week but desiring growth in their life. I pray that as I share these words, 
God, you'd bring them to life and you would connect them to our hearts through the work of your spirit. I ask for your help today as I make myself available to you. I ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. So let's talk about this. What does it look like for Jesus to be the king of our hearts? Um, here's the first thing that as I was answering that question and I was looking through this passage and I was thinking about this triumphal entry. I was thinking about what we call Palm Sunday. I think it's this picture that we would be willing to serve as he came to serve. That we'd be willing to look at people as he looked at people. We'd be willing to love people as he loved people. Now, now listen to this, verses one through three again. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there. Now, notice this, okay? This is really important. Go into the village over there, he said, and as soon as you enter it, you'll see a donkey tied there with his colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. And I love this line. If anyone asks you what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he'll immediately let you take them. Now, part of what's going on here in this scene is that you have a prophecy from the Old Testament that's being fulfilled. In fact, in Zechariah, I'm just going to read it to you, years back, right? Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and he is victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So what you have here is, is these folks, many of them would have known this Old Testament prophecy. And so when Jesus comes cruising in on this donkey, right, with his colt, instantly there would have been a connection. This would have been part of like fulfilling this prophecy and giving people um, this validation that what's happening was written down and that God is bringing it about, that this is their king. In fact, um, can you imagine, I was thinking about this story. Um, I, I was sitting and I was writing this message and I was thinking about this story and I was thinking about these two guys that all of a sudden Jesus says to them, he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into that next village and, and you're gonna find a donkey tied there with a little colt and I just want you to go up and take them. I mean, really what it should say, I want you to go in there, um, walk in there, don't ask anybody, just steal them, right? Are you picturing this with me? And, and in, in fact, he's almost expecting that there could be opposition. And he says, in fact, if anyone says anything to you, just say, the Lord needs them. Now, like what kind of advice is that, right? That, that would be like, you know, I mean, in, in going in Jesus' name, right? Like, hey, let's just go and go to your neighbors. Just take it. Just, just take what you need and tell them the Lord needs it. That is terrible advice, right, for us nowadays. That would not go well. Let me, let me just make that clear. But I thought such an interesting picture. Tough stuff. Think about what those two guys must have been going through their heads. Yeah, right. Like, so, so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to walk up and just take somebody's donkey and the colt, untie it, and just walk away with it? And if somebody asks us, we just say the Lord needs it? Like, I don't know about you, but I would have thought, oh, I don't really want this job. In fact, Lord, why don't you pick out somebody else? I mean, I'm just not that forward, right? I don't know that I have that much courage. Just like, I don't really want to go steal somebody's donkey. And yet what you find, if you look in Matthew 21, 6 and 7, it says the, the two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. You know, I, I do believe this, loving Jesus and loving others is, is really about being tuned in to our relationship with God enough that we're willing to do what he asks. Loving Jesus really and, and making him the king of our hearts means we're willing to listen to what he says and we're willing to do what he asks. And, and, and I know this from my own personal life. I think many of you would testify to this too. There's sometimes he asks you to do things that you don't wanna do. There's times when your own like self will rise up and be like, uh -uh, I don't wanna do that. And yet you know in your heart the thing that he's asking you to do. You know in your heart the thing that's right to do. 
But making Jesus king means he has authority to not only tell you what to do, but that you see him and say, yes, I'll do what you ask me to do. I was actually, I was, I was in a um, last, last weekend um, before I arrived at the Ottawa campus on a Sunday morning, uh, my wife and I stopped by a donut shop. I mean, I know you're probably shocked that I like donuts, but um, I mean, I, ooh, I love donuts. And we stopped at a donut shop and we were in there and we were picking out what we wanted. And there was another gentleman in there. He was probably about my age and he had three little kids and, and they were picking out donuts. And they were like, yeah, I want two of these. I want two of these and give me two of the white frosted over here and two. And I'm kind of just listening and watching and he gets all done picking out his donuts and she gets them all put in the bag. And all of a sudden I see him walk over to the counter to pay. And then I see him like walk away from the counter. He walks back towards me where I'm standing, you know, still like, you know, slobber coming out as I'm staring at the donuts, right? And he walks past me and he says to his kids, hey kids, come on. And, and I could tell they were like, I mean, in fact, maybe one of them even they mumbled something, I think along the lines of like, what, what are we doing? And he said, I, I, he said, kids, look, we're going to come back. I didn't realize that this donut shop only took cash. Daddy has to go get some money. Now, at that time, I'm sitting there, you know, it's early in the morning and I'm staring at the donuts and I watch this guy kind of, he's grabbing his kids and he's walking out. And um, there was this little voice that I could have like, I heard, right? And the little voice was like, hey, just open your mouth and tell him, like, you, you're just gonna take care of those donuts. And, and he's marching out. I hear the voice, but I mean, I'm, I'm tired. I'm not exactly with it yet. And I'm kind of like, no, that's really like, that's kind of dumb. It's kind of forward. I'm sure he's gonna think like, you know, who is this weird guy trying to buy my donuts? And I, and I just kind of watch him. I watch him walk out the door. And, and, and in my head, I'm still thinking, I'm still processing. I mean, sometimes, I don't know about you, the Lord tells me things, but I'm not always the sharpest. And I'm not always the quickest, right, to respond. Maybe you are, I'm not. And then all of a sudden, I hear his voice again. This time, it sounds a lot like, man, it sounds a lot like my wife's voice. And she says, go tell him we'll buy his donuts. And then instantly, I, I mean, hey, I may hesitate on the Lord's voice, but I don't hesitate on my wife's voice, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And, and then I thought, it's too late. It's too late. Like I knew the Lord was telling me, it's too late. I missed it. But then I was like, no, I didn't. And I, I went marching out that door. I walked out to his car. He's putting his kids in the car seat. And I was like, oh Lord, this is so awkward. But I walked up, I said, hey, excuse me, sir. I said, did, did you say you forgot your cash and that's why you didn't get your donuts? And he said, yeah. And I said, listen, I want you to come back in and I just, I, I, I'm gonna buy your donuts. And he's like, no. And I said, yeah, seriously, I, I want you to come on in. I'm gonna buy your donuts. And he was like, no, like, I'm just gonna go around the corner. My bank is right around the corner. And he just wouldn't let me do it. I thought to myself, that was my fault. Had I stopped the man in the door, had, had I responded when his voice immediately said something, it would have worked out just fine. You know, I, I go out when he's already got the kids in the car seats, right? And I think he's thinking, I don't want to owe you anything. I don't know you. Who are you going to like to buy my donuts? But, but here's, here's, here's what I was thinking about, right? It, it goes to beg the question, are we really willing to do what Jesus asks us to do when he asks us to do it? I, I don't know about you. I mean, I feel like I try to remain open. I, I mean, I, I feel like I've come a long way in my life where I, I try to be open because I, typically when I do what he asks me to do, I see good results from it. But I also know this, there are so many times that I hesitate. There's so many times I procrastinate and I don't know about you, but I miss opportunities. And so I think that's a place where I wanna grow in my life. I, I don't want God's voice just to be a voice. I want him to be the king. I want it to be when he says something, I respond to it. That when he says something, I don't question it. I don't say how it's gonna go. I don't say this is how I feel about it, but then I'm willing to respond on the spot. Now, here's what we know, though. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look different because our king looks different. The things he will ask us to do are going to look different. At times, they're going to make us uncomfortable because we serve an unusual king. I even love the fact that 
you picture this, right? Jesus is asking for a donkey. I wouldn't have looked much cooler if he'd asked for like a white horse and he would have just kind of, you know, come in like tall on a horse. Wouldn't that have looked cool? But see, he asked for a donkey and this little colt and, and that's what he comes riding in on. But the truth is the donkey symbolized something. If he would have come in on a stallion, it would have symbolized power. It would have symbolized like I, I'm coming in to conquer something. He rode in on a donkey because it symbolized humility and it symbolized peace. That he wasn't coming in for this massive takeover, that what he was coming in was to usher in peace. Billy Graham, we know, right? Like um, incredible Christian man and um, who, who passed in, in the recent month. And there was a quote that I saw from him. In fact, this is what he says. He says, one reason the crowds turned against Jesus was because he refused to be the kind of king they wanted, a political military leader who would free them from the hated Roman government. Roman soldiers had occupied their land for decades and they hoped Jesus would lead them in a successful revolt. Here, here's what you have. So people, they're looking for this powerful king that's going to like flip everything on its, on its head, right? That Jesus is going to come in and for once, the, the, these folks who are in power are going to learn who's really in power. This is our king. But Jesus made it clear that he's a different kind of king, ushering in a different kind of kingdom in a different kind of way. God had another purpose for him. His goal was to establish another kingdom, the kingdom of God. In fact, John 18 puts it this way. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Back to Billy Graham, he said another quote, which it, it really, it kind of shook me this week. Um, it, 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 it really rattled me and it really got me thinking. It says this, where would you have been during Jesus' final days? Would you have been in the crowd demanding his death? Or would you have been, been among the minority who remain true to him? And are you true to him today? Words from Billy Graham. See, that statement really messed me up. Like, where would I have been? Would I have been true to him, even if he'd looked like a different kind of king that would have been hard to recognize, right? And am I still true to him today. Here's why it, 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 it messed with me because here's some things that came to mind for me. I thought if, if we're honest with ourselves, living for Jesus, it looks so different than the world around us. And yet how often do people see loving kind of actions in me that just look so contrary to anything else? I mean, I wish I could say, I think people see it every day. I think the people who are in relationships with me, they see it. The truth is they probably don't see it enough. I don't, I think there's times when I myself get in the way. I was thinking about, does the way I love people really look different? Do I serve or do I look to be served? Do I love or do I look to be loved? Does the way I practice forgiveness really look different than the people around me? Would, would I have wanted to ride in on a donkey or would I have wanted to ride in on a big white horse? Would I have wanted to claim power or would I be willing to say, I will show up in the midst of my weakness because his kingdom looks so different and his power is made perfect in my weakness. You know, Here's, here's just the straight up end of it, right? To follow Jesus looks way different than the world that we live. Jesus' entry into this, this triumphal entry looks so different than what people were expecting. Now, here's what I also want you thinking about. I was thinking about what does it look like, right, for him to be king of our hearts. I think it comes down to this really simple reality. For Jesus to be king of our hearts, which, which leads to being able to love people like him. If we are consumed with him, he will flow out. If we're not consumed with him, we will flow out. 
And when he comes overflowing, it looks much different than me. For us to crown him king, we have to proclaim that we are not. For us to crown him king of our hearts, we have to proclaim that we are not. It's not a seeking of power, but it's a relinquishing of it. I met with someone this week, and um, I want to tell you, I was so encouraged from this meeting. I had no idea the story I was going to hear when I showed up in this meeting. In fact, I knew I was meeting with someone who's struggling. They're struggling physically. They've got some severe pain going on in their life. Uh, They're hurting. It's been going on for, for too long. They don't know uh, for sure how to deal with it. They're trying to seek medical attention, um, but they're very, I knew, they, they gotta be frustrated, right? And, and I've been praying for this individual, but as I sat across from them and shared a meal with them, I listened to them talk, and, and here's what they said. One of the things she communicated to me was this. She said, she said um, I said, so how are you? And I expected to hear, I'm not doing well. I expected that I was going to have to encourage and to be a cheerleader and like really try to lift this person up to let them know it was going to be okay. But here's what I heard. I heard that in in the midst of her pain, in the midst of not being able to get around very well, that she's kind of up and down and up and down. And she said, so here's what I'm doing. I find myself walking around the house all day. Like I'm trying to stretch things and I'm walking around the house all day. But what I discovered in the midst of walking around the house all day, I just talk to him. And she said, it's not with pretty words. It's not with these like, you know, incredible phrases. I just talk to him. I talk to him about my pain. I talk to him about my relationship with him. I talk to him about everything. And my relationship with him is at a place that it's never, ever been. I listened to that and I was like, Oh my, like I showed up thinking I was gonna hear from someone who is in, is in this absolutely terrible place. And the truth is physically, they're not in a great place, but spiritually they're in a place that's better than they've ever been. And then I listened to her say, she said, you know what? And it's really weird, Kevin, because the, the Lord has given me a verse and he's given it to me over and over and I've kind of struggled with it. Like, what does it mean? Here's the verse and I want you to hear it. Second Corinthians 12, nine. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. I looked at her and I said, that verse, it's perfect for you. My grace is sufficient is another way in which that could read in different versions of the Bible. My grace is all you need. It's this idea that Jesus, you are enough. That when she's walking around that house and she's circling around the house and she's talking to him, that even in the midst of pain and even when she wishes things would be different, that at the end of the day, it's okay because his presence is so real in her life and he is what she needs. Or or I thought about this, like this idea that in the midst of what everyone else from the outside would say is this weakened state, It's this place where physically she's struggling and a place where physically she feels weak that she's as strong as she's ever been. It's the picture of Jesus and what he does when he takes residence in us. That when people start a relationship with him, it changes us because Jesus comes and he says, if you will make yourself weak as when I rode in on a donkey, I think we're looking for Jesus to come in and like be power and that we are supposed to be this strong people who ride in on white horses. And what he's saying is humble yourself because following me looks like humbling yourself and leaning on me. And I am the kind of king that ushers in a different kind of kingdom in your life that says in the midst of your weak places, I can make you strong. In the places where you think there's, there's absolutely, it's impossible to love, I can love through you. In the places in your life where it would seem impossible to forgive, I can help you to forgive and set you free. That Jesus is an incredible king that back here in this scripture looks different than all the others. And I don't think much has changed. I think in our world when he's the king of our hearts that it looks different 
It looks different than the kingdoms around us as well. That his kingdom is uniquely different. That he's ushering in peace. That he's ushering in strength in the midst of weakness. And that when we live that way, we are showing people what the king really looks like. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that God, you came to be the king of our hearts and you came to usher in a new kingdom. God, I pray that we would evaluate, that we would look, we would say, where is our, like, where are our, our priorities? God, are we still reigning in our life or are you reigning in our life? Are we listening to you or being obedient to you? Are we taking orders from you? Or are we still calling the shots? God, are we... Are we walking around in our own power and strength? Or are we admitting our weakness and seeing your power and strength? God, I pray that you would continue to move through our people. Love through our people. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.